Hello, hello. Sorry, I think I'm gonna. We're gonna get started here. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, for today, I'm I'm happy to introduce our speaker, uh, Mike Mike Crickmore, uh, visiting us from Harvard University. Uh, for those uh, physically here, I want to uh, mention that there is a, a virtual audience uh, also involved, and so. Um, I think what we decided is that if, if any of you have questions, um, please feel free to ask throughout the talk. Uh, uh, Mike's going to like repeat the question for those who are not here uh, so they can hear. And for those uh, watching virtually, the idea is they can type, type their questions in uh, on Zoom. And at the end, um, I'll review the questions and, um, and pass them on to Mike. Um, so a little bit about Mike. Mike is currently um, an assistant professor at uh, Boston Children's Hospital, um, part of the Harvard Medical School. Um, he actually did his graduate work uh, here at Columbia with with uh, with Richard Mann, um, studying um, molecular and genetic mechanisms of organ development, um, specifically focused on uh, the role of Hox genes in regulating uh, morphogenic mobility. Um, Mike went on to do his postdoctoral research with Leslie Vossel at Rockefeller University and sort of began his, his foray into neurobiology uh, at that time, um, establishing um, copulation duration in Drosophila as a model system for a very, I think, fundamental question in neuroscience, that is um, how the nervous system keeps track of time uh, during persistent behaviors. Um, and as a professor at Harvard, uh, Mike has sort of dug deeper into this, uh, into the realm of, of uh, um, the courtship system in males, and both uh, with a number of studies done in the brain, understanding the role of dopamine signaling in modulating the initiation and persistence of courtship, um, and also in the mental nerve cord, I think bringing a really interesting molecular um, story to the picture where uh, chem kinase two is involved in measuring time on the order of uh, multiple minutes um, in networks of neurons. And, Today, uh, Mike will be talking to us about uh, molecular computation in the brain, um, and we're excited to have you. Thanks. That was a great job. Me failed in this turning the mic off. Job. Wow. Over there, it's um, man. Is it nice to be here? Um, it was uh, 20 years ago next month that I uh, moved here to New York to start my PhD at uh, at Columbia. So I've been thinking a lot about those times these days and it was perfect. For me, it was perfect. I might be romanticizing a little bit, but the science that was going on was inspirational. I felt really supported. Um, I felt that we could do amazing things. And um, I also had the feeling that you really didn't wanna be wrong here. And so all those knobs were like right, exactly at the right point um, for me. So. So yeah, I had a great uh, I had a great time, and I hope that the the students that are here now are feeling the same way that I did 15 to 20 years ago. And a lot of the um, the influence of being here, I think, guides my the work in my lab today. Um, and so I start off my talk with something that I wouldn't have thought 15 or 20 years ago that I would need to say, but I think I do um, in behavioral neuroscience and. That's a state of ground truth for me, which is that brains are made out of cells. And cells have all sorts of computational mechanisms. I mean, that's how they build the sophistication and diversity, the majesty of the biological world. And a lot of that happens without electrical activity. So when I think about emergent properties of the brain, and my lab's principally interested in motivation, of course, of course, we think at, at least as much about molecular and cellular mechanisms as we do about electrical and, and, and circuit mechanisms. And in fact, the stuff we do in our lab, the models that we come up with, the behaviors that we study, wouldn't make that much sense if we didn't take into consideration molecular computation. So that's the title of my talk, and that's what I want to emphasize today, is that understanding molecular computations that are undergoing in circuits is not really a complicating factor for me, but a clarifying one. And so sometimes I think that some of the results in, in modern behavioral neuroscience could use a little bit of clarifying, or at least they're, they're a little bit hard for me to, to understand. So I'm going to share a couple of papers, but I want to be super clear that I'm not trying to critique these papers. They're actually some of my favorite papers in the field, but just so we're on the same page that we know what we're talking about. Um, 
this is a, a paper from Will Allen when he was a graduate student in Carl Weisseroth's lab. And we have a pretty simple task here where the animal, a mouse in this case, is thirsty and it's getting a water reward in response to this go cue and not the no go cue. And what they found is the same kind of thing that a lot of people are finding is that if you record from a brain region, these are voltage signals uh, from individual brain regions laid out here on the y axis. Most people have done this from a single brain region found that where you could decode the behavior, the motivational state, a lot of things about the, the, what the animal was doing from the population level dynamics in a certain brain region. But what was different here is they did it for essentially every single brain region and found essentially the same thing in every brain region. That's how you can decode the behavior of the animal from, from the population uh, dynamics. And it's not just that these are a small population of cells in, uh, in these brain regions, when you look at the fraction of the neurons down here that's modulated in response to the task, it's about 50% in every brain region, leading the authors to conclude that the way that this motivational state is encoded is essentially by half of the neurons in the brain. And this, this diverges so radically from the kind of results that I'm going to show you about, I'm going to show you today that we find in my lab, where based on what was the ethos at the time when I was here, at least I had the feeling from rotating Ivan Greenwald's lab, from training Richard Mann's lab, that when you want to study a mysterious phenomenon, you study it in the simplest system in which you can see evidence for it. And for me, that's the reproductive behaviors of Drosophila. We're thinking about things like motivation because the fly brain's small, but honestly, for me, it's still too big. There's hundreds of thousands of neurons, each of them forming hundreds or thousands of synaptic connections. But if we focus just on the reproductive behaviors, we can reduce the problem by about 50 fold because about 2% of the neurons are different between males and females. And those neurons are of course key for instructing the reproductive behaviors. In fact, if you switch the sex of those 2% of the neurons, you can switch the behaviors between male and female. So here you can see this is 50% of the brain involved in some way of coding this really simple behavior, right? You're thirsty and then you lick to water. But I'm gonna show you some small slice of the richness of Drosophila reproductive behaviors, of which for all of them, only 2% of the neurons do basically, do basically everything. And you could say, well, yeah, well, one difference is this is a mouse and that's a fly and they're just different, right? And I, I don't think that that's the case. And one reason I think that is from this uh, new paper, or, or a preprint from Richard Axel and, and Larry Abbott, where instead of training the animal to do something, they have a fly on a ball uh, and a two photon microscope looking down at what I presume to be 14, close to 1500, almost random neurons as the animals doing things that flies do, run, don't run, or groom. And what you can see here in green is what's happening when it's running. And here you see that, I'll just quote them, strikingly most of the image neurons throughout the brain show a pattern of activity that's correlated with running. So also in flies, a lot of the neurons are active when you're doing a lot of things. And you could say, okay, well, running is kind of like a heightened state of activity. And we know from some work in mammals and in specific brain regions that you can get amplification of signals in response to running. So maybe that's a running specific thing. And again, I don't think so. Because here my friend Mala Murphy was interested in understanding how the female brain processes courtship song. So she plays in red or blue aspects of the courtship song to a female that's just sitting there or actually just white noise in black. And you can see here, it looks a lot like the Dicerov paper where essentially all these ROIs, these are calcium dynamics here, are responding to even white noise. And here you can see in essentially every brain region that they recorded from. So this is a big problem. At least it seems like it is to me that most of the neurons in the brain are activated by most actions and most things that happen. And I think the standard solution to this is to turn to the theorists and the computational neuroscientists and say, what can you guys do for us? Like, how can you, how can you sort this out? We need better computational models. And nobody's more excited to hear about those things than, than I am. But I'm here to say that I think that, as I said at the beginning, understanding molecular computation that's underlying this could provide a kind of guiding light into understanding what all this information means. And there's two specific things that I wanna, two points that I wanna emphasize today. One that has relevance to this brain-wide activity in response to lots of behaviors and lots of things that happen to the animal. One is that neural computations can be voltage and calcium independent. This is not new, of course, and, and a guiding light in my research has been the, the work in circadian rhythms that was worked out in Drosophila and then extended on into mammals and then into humans, should to be conservation at the level of gene, genes and at the level of, of function. 
And if we just do a thought experiment to think about if we use standard systems neuroscience techniques to understand circadian rhythms, and we had not done that Drosophila genetics that revealed the core molecular computation in a small group of cells that's anticipating the turning of the earth, what would our, what would our picture of circadian rhythms be like? What would the code for circadian rhythms be? I think it would just be the pattern of activity, population level, and specific brain regions throughout the day. And that would be so off to almost be wrong, I would say. Here, I'm going to show you an example of neural computations that can be voltage and calcium independent on smaller time scales as well. The second major point that I want to emphasize is that voltage spikes and calcium transients can be, can be subthreshold. So just the way that we think of miniature excitatory synaptic potentials, they can contribute to an action potential, but they don't always. And when they don't, what happens? We just think that they just go away. You know, they don't contribute to anything if they don't cause an action potential. I wonder if a lot of this calcium signaling that we see in the brain could contribute to something, but like miniature excitatory synaptic potentials, maybe they often don't. I'm gonna to try to make these two points using two recent papers from my lab. This one, uh, this one, um, reports the first neuronal interval timing mechanism that Kevin was talking about. And this one reports a circuit mechanism that we call the eruption, which is like an action potential for, for neuronal networks. Both of them were first authored by my graduate student, Stephen Thornquist, and this one he's co-first authored with a postdoc in my lab, Maxi Pitch. Okay, so I'm gonna give you that small slice of Drosophila reproductive behavior. And in this short video, I'm gonna show you three motivated decisions that are going to happen. This is a male fly here. I feel like I'm walking out of the zoom picture, but um, and maybe I should get a pointer or something like that, but I'm just going to kid you pointing with my hand until somebody tells me not to do that. There's a male fly, and this is a female fly here. Um, and the first decision you're going to see is the male deciding to court the female. We study this a lot. It has a lot to do with the life, the, uh, the recent history of the male. And in any case, he's going to decide to court this female. Now, the female is going to have to decide whether or not to accept his courtship. We also study that in the lab, as a lot of labs do, and it's a really interesting decision. But we're going to be most interested today in a third decision that happens. And that's the decision of when and under which circumstances this mating going to be terminated. So you can see here's the courtship song sticking out the, the wing. Normally it goes on for several minutes, but it's truncated here because we're not that interested in it. We're more interested in the male achieving this copulation posture by keeping his abdomen bent, working to get his head up above the wings, and then he's going to maintain that posture for about 23 uh, minutes. And it's really accurate. Standard deviation of about four minutes, which is better than you guys would do if I asked you to raise your hand 20, 23 minutes from now. But you can see the fly is going to do it here. And we know from many experiments that it's the male's nervous system that's encoding time here. So we're looking at this. This is this third decision is, is uh, handed over to the male. And then, of course, the female gets to decide where to lay the egg. So it's about decisions bouncing back and forth. So I was really interested in the study of time and wanted to see what the literature could provide. And honestly, it wasn't that much. So here's what a review looked like in 2004. We have the time uh, on the analog axis on the Y scale and then mechanisms that we have neural mechanisms of timekeeping on the right. And you can see for microseconds, we've kind of got that under control and then circadian rhythms, you know, our dotting light here, we've got that under control too. But then from milliseconds to seconds to minutes to hours, is just question marks. There's nothing the literature can say. I think this is, first of all, it's 2004, but even 2004 is a little bit harsh. I think you, we could say up to 500 milliseconds, maybe even two seconds, that you could get circuit mechanisms that would explain timekeeping on that scale. But between two seconds and 24 hours, I think everyone would agree, including the, the author of this more recent article, the one may be inclined to state that research are actually clueless concerning the question of how the brain processes time. So Inspired by circadian rhythms, the first thing I did when I started my lab seven years ago was to set up an automated screening system that could go really fast and allow us to process a lot of genotypes because there just weren't hypotheses out there. And so the, the screen looked like this. We have 32 well plates with a female, a wild type female, because again, we know that her genome and her neurons don't influence the timing behavior, um, and a male with different genotypes in every well. And we plot the distance between the flies and it turns out that the only reason that they stay in close proximity for more than a couple of seconds is if they're mating. And so you can read that out here. So basically, as quick as you can make these males, which is very fast in Drosophila, you can test a couple hours later how long they mated for. And we're really lucky that it was so fast because it took a long time, at least in terms of genomes, 
to get a, the kind of hit that we wanted. So that scale bar is 100 genotypes. Each one of these tick marks that you can't resolve because they're too clustered together is at least eight matings. So there's tens of thousands of matings in here and thousands of genotypes until eventually we get this blue thing at the end, which is a manipulation within sexual dimorphic circuitry. So the fruitless, fruitless is a, um, a promoter that will label a lot of the neurons that are different between males and females. And we do a manipulation of the enzyme CAN-K2 that I'm gonna argue is the first reported neuronal interval timer. And I think it can be flexible for a wide range of, of time scales. And you know, maybe if we'd been a little bit smarter, we could have avoided that whole scheme process um, because CAN-K2 is just obviously a timer. It's well studied in the memory field. We have a crystal structure of it. We can see that it's arranged in a circle. So there's 12 individual subunits, each of which have an association domain as well as a kinase domain. And they're, uh, they're arranged in a circle of 12, just like a clock. Here I'm only showing you four of them. And the kinase domain is sort of folded in, in the inactive state, trying to phosphorylate a pseudo substrate domain on the association domain. So and that's how the kinase remains inactive. It's constantly trying to phosphorylate this association domain, but it can't do it. When calcium comes in, it binds to this, this linker domain, which has two interesting features for us. One is the comodulin binding domain. So calcium binds to comodulin, binds to this linker domain, prize open the kinase. And then the other little purple stripe here is the residue T287, threonine 287. And that's an important residue for CAMK2 because it receives autophosphorylation. So once the kinase is active, it can phosphorylate lots of things in the cell, but one of its favorite things to phosphorylate is the neighboring subunit in the circle, right? So this is why people study CAMK2 so heavily in the memory field since since the mid eighties, because it essentially is a molecular memory of earlier calcium transients. And people like John Lithman would argue that this is why you remember your first, fifth, fifth birthday party, because something happened that phosphorylated CAMK2 and it just kept phosphorylating itself in a circle faster than phosphatases were able to pluck it off. So it just stayed there from, you know, 80 years ago and it's still there. And that's why you have the memory. I don't, really like ha take a, uh, a side in that debate. Some people think that CAMP2 is only around for a little bit of time to get passed off to, uh, to other genes. But what I do think is that this is a really good timing mechanism, right? Because you just bump up the activity, it can sustain itself for however long you can keep the phosphatases down. So you can tune it to tune the phosphatase content to get however long activity you want out of CAMP2. And that's what I'm gonna argue is happening for time out this system. But I've got to move the goalposts on you. So, we're, we were talking about a 23 minute timer, that's how long mating is. But as we've looked closer and closer at mating, we found that there are timers within timers, sometimes within timers. So within this 23 minute timer, I'm gonna tell you about a six minute timer that we found. So at six minutes, you're about to pass six minutes into mating, you didn't see anything happen, you can't see anything happen from the outside. But we're in motivation lab, so a lot of what we do is put our drives, put, not our drives, put the drives of the flies in conflict. So here we're obviously fulfilling the drive and the consumatory phase of the drive to reproduce. But what about the survival drive? So what if I heat up the floor of this chamber to 44 degrees Celsius? If I do that for two minutes, the flies will start dying. We don't do that when we do it for one minute, which doesn't seem to harm them, but it scares them a lot. And you can imagine that the, the way, the best way that these guys could escape, the male could allow himself and his partner to escape is to break up and fly away. They can't fly in this configuration here. And so what we do is we ask the male, is this mating worth your life at various times into the mating? If we do that at one minute, the mating just started, the answer is always no. The fraction terminating in response to the heat threat is always zero. Done this tens of thousands of times, it's always zero. Same thing at three minutes into mating, it's always zero. By five minutes, it's not always zero. Sometimes, sometimes they'll break up. And by seven minutes, they, they almost always break up. And by 10 minutes, they'll always terminate the mating and flee the heat threat that we, that we provide. So at six minutes, there's a huge shift in the motivational state of these flies. And this is not true of just heat, but any kind of lethal threat that we, that we give them, that before six minutes, the male will stick it out. Afterwards, he won't. So six minutes is a really important time in the mating because that's when sperm is transferred. So I'll tell you a little bit about how the fly mating happen. It's a little bit strange, but things happen before. Some mechanical things happen before six minutes, as well as some chemical things get, that get transferred, and things happen after six minutes, but it's at six minutes the sperm gets transferred. Now, if I break up these, these matings at seven minutes, the matings are fertile, and we can't see in the lab any difference, any reason why the male is actually mating for the last 23 minutes. There must be a reason 
But obviously the mayor doesn't think it's that important either because he'll terminate the meeting. He'll abandon that last 17 minutes if he if he's threatened in this in this lethal way. So the important thing here is that six minutes, there's a timer that tells sperm to go over, and it also changes the motivational state of the mail. And it's those features that I'm going to talk about today. And we were very lucky that around the time that we started doing the screen, Tim Taylor and David Anderson's lab found a population of just four neurons, not the 2,000 neurons that are labeled by fruitless, but just four neurons that label with this neuropeptide uh, chlorozonin that when he silenced them, he had these two telling phenotypes for us. One is the meetings were infertile because they didn't transfer sperm, and the other is that the meetings lasted for several hours. So we took that GAL4 line and we put this version of CAMK2 that we hit in the screen that maybe now you'll recognize the T287, that's the, that's the residue that receives that autophosphorylation that keeps CAMK2 active, the purple residue from the cartoon. Instead of allowing its phosphorylation state to go up and down, we fix it in the active state with this aspartic acid substitution. So it's a phosphor mimic. The simple way to think about it is the, it's a constitutively active CAMK2. But more accurately, it's a calcium independent version of CAMK2. But anyway, you can think about it as just activating CAMK2. When we did that, we just changed this one amino acid to this one protein, these four neurons, larvae were not produced, so no progeny were produced, or very rarely produced, and the meetings were, in some cases, what, eight hours long, or something like that, but some, some spread starting an hour long, it certainly wasn't 23 minutes. And we knew we were doing more than just breaking the neurons for a couple of reasons. One is, if we included in this cross CS crimson, which allow us to activate the neurons electrically in response to a light pulse. So this is a red light gated cation channel. And we did that, say for 30 seconds at around six minutes, we could recover, even in the background of this CAMK2 manipulation, we could recover fertility and we could collapse down. You can't really see because the y-axis here, but we could collapse down the mating duration so that it was 23 minutes. Our lab's interested in motivation. And so we we're interested in the motivational dynamics of these neurons, and we did this by silencing them, by expressing the leak potassium channel KR 2.1, and asking the flies the question, has it been six minutes yet? Do you think it's been six minutes yet? The way we do that is with that lethal, the potentially lethal 44 degree heat threat that you see on the y-axis, and you can see in the gray parental controls, if we ask it one, two, three minutes, the answer is always no, it hasn't been six minutes. Yes, I'm willing to sacrifice my life for this meeting. If it's afterwards, at seven or 10 minutes at the top, you can see they all terminate the meeting. So they say, yes, it's been six minutes because it has been six minutes. If we silence these chlorozone neurons, they continue to say, no, it hasn't been six minutes at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes in because the way that they know that six minutes of mating has, has passed and that it's time to transfer sperm and it's time to shift out of this motivational state is by watching the activity of CAMK2 in these chlorozone neurons. And here, because the electrical activity is blocked, the output of the chlorozone neurons is blocked. If that's true, we should be able to get the same phenotype by instead of silencing the whole neuron, just manipulating this one amino acid, which by the way, doesn't change the membrane voltage of these neurons at all, does it a different way than, than electrical silencing that I'm gonna talk about for a lot of the rest of my talk. But we still see when we ask these flies at 60 minutes, has it been six minutes yet? The answer is no, because the way that they know it's been six minutes is by looking down at the activity of CAMK2 in these four chlorozone neurons. And if it's still active there, they think it hasn't been six minutes yet. If that's true, I should be able to do the inverse experiment to reduce CAMK2 uh, activity. We've done this in several ways. And you should be able to speed up the timer, right? Here's one way that, that I like doing it. It's with a photoactivatable um, version of CAMK2, so optogenetics, but instead of manipulating electrical activity, we manipulate the activity of CAMK2. And we're really lucky that the CAMK2 field in the mammalian hippocampus is super advanced, and this tool we borrowed from Rio Hiasada, who's a part of that field, and we turned it, we uh, repurposed it for flies. So the way that it works is that it's made photoactivatable by fusion to a Lev2 domain from plants. It kind of like folds in on itself and obscures this AIP2 part, which is a peptide inhibitor of CAMK2. So only in the presence of blue light, which will create a conformational change that will expose the inhibitor, only then can it inhibit the, the kinase. So basically, blue light on, CAMK2 activity down. If we just shove this thing into the core zone neurons and ask at three minutes, look at the y-axis at three minutes into the meeting, has it been six minutes yet? Every fly knows it has not been. If you shine blue light on either half a second, half a minute after they started mating or half a minute before you do the heat threat, then a large pr proportion of them say, or respond as if six minutes has passed. Because what they do is they look down at the activity of CAMK2 and we've turned it off here. So they think 
it's been six minutes, even though it's only been three minutes. The last part of this is we should be able to see CAMQ2 activity changing over the course of six minutes if this is a neural timer. You, know, you can see that in the circadian clock. And for this, we learned this incredible technique from Gary Yellen and Bernardo Sabatini at, uh, at Harvard. I don't know why everybody else doesn't use it. It's not that hard to rig out your 2P to do fluorescence lifetime imaging instead of standard intensity imaging. It's got a ton of benefits that, um, that I, won't get, uh, I won't get into, but just imagine that you're, instead of collecting bulk photons and trying to look at the activity of fluorophore from that, you're looking at an atomic property of the fluorophore itself by bidding the photon arrival times with regard to each of the 80 million laser pulses that happen every second. So it's, you need some fast electronics, but it's not that hard, and there's some really good experts out there for it, and you, your signal is so clean. It's not dependent on concentration. It's not dependent on anything obscuring. So anyway, we can, there's a CAMK2 sensor that again we repurposed from Rio Hayasuda's lab into flies, and it's fret-based. So it's based on the conformational change of CAMK2, right, where when the kinase domain is close to, it, to the association domain, you get fret between a donor and acceptor fluorophore, but that conformational change breaks the fret because fret is dependent to the sixth power on distance. So once they get a little far away, you don't get fret anymore. And one consequence of that is that you have a longer fluorescent lifetime. We can measure that out here. It's a small change, about 150 picoseconds, but it's super robust. And we can activate CAMK2 through putting this variant channel adoption uh, in at the top into the core zone neurons and driving calcium into the cell, which will activate CAMK2 and looking at the time scale over which it decreases. And you can see that it's about six minutes. So maybe if you believe this sort of sketched out version, I can say that there is now an interval timer on the minute scale on the six minute scale. And maybe we can put like one of those question marks would have like CAMK2 in. But actually I think CAMK2 might fill in that whole stream of question marks. And the reason is because if we take this sensor and we put it in the next neuron over and we have no idea what this neuron does, we do the same stimulation pattern. It goes up and it comes down over 30 seconds. And if we go to the next neuron, we don't know what that neuron does, but we know that CAMK2 stays active for 30 minutes every time. We go to the next neuron, we activate CAMK2, and we can't keep our imaging prep around long enough for it to come down. It just stays up. So I think CAMK2 is a tunable interval timer that can work in different cells to give you the circuit function that you want in that, in that circuit. And so, you know, you might wonder, well, how often are we actually doing interval timing? And I think it might be more often than than you suspect. I'm going to show you some examples of that going forward. But in principle, time is a really powerful way for neural networks to organize themselves. I mean, if, if you believe that there's like a sensation of time, which it certainly seems that CAMK2 in a way is doing here, you don't need a sensory organ for it, right? It'll pass through the skull and all neurons can do it. All you need is a dedicated timer. And CAMK2 is conserved in sponges. That T287 residue is the same in humans. There's two isoforms, one is T286, but it's 100% conserved. It's in every neuron. It could be doing this, this role, it could be playing this role in a, lot of, in a lot of circuits. And I'll show you a little bit of that at the end. In this system, I think CAMK2 becomes active at the beginning of mating, declines over the course of six minutes to allow the output of the core zone neurons. That output allows the termination of mating, either in response to opposing drives like survival, but also other drives as well, or that 23 minute timer that I've been trying to study for the last seven or more years and kind of haven't really got my, um, my hands completely around yet, although I'll show you a little bit of data on that towards the end. So the, because of CAMK2, because of the richness of the biochemistry and structural biology and people have been working on it for decades, we're able to make really rapid progress. So there's still some things that we don't understand um, about the system. One is how does CAMK2 get active in the first place? One thing I can tell you is that it's voltage independent. If we don't allow the neurons to be active, they still get active, CAMK2 is still active. And the ticking of the clock is also voltage independent. That's what I'm talking about with my point number one, that here's a computation, I'm gonna show you evidence for that. But this core neural computation, if you wanted to know what was the switch that changed the life or death decision of the male, why does he terminate the mating after, but not before six minutes? you wouldn't get it from, from voltage or calcium dynamics. You would have to look at the activity of CAMK2 to get it. So we're also interested in how it slopes down over six minutes and how it slopes down in different neurons over different time scales. Phosphatases are an obvious answer and that turns out to be largely true. We're just trying to figure out if there's any kind of higher order principles that we can find. But the next section of my talk, I'm gonna tell you about the output. What do I mean that the cores and neurons are allowed to give their output at six minutes uh, into the mating?
And the answer is going to be something that we call the eruption. We got into this question from thinking about this problem in ways like this. So there's four cores and neurons. I told you that's that's not very many, but it's already kind of a lot. And when you think about it, here we're doing that with fluorescence lifetime imaging to like watch the activity of CAMP KT decline over time in two neurons in the from the same fly. And it's pretty robust, but there's some differences, right? And when you think about something like an event that happens in the brain, like it happens once, right? The male is going to transfer sperm one time. So which one is it? Is it the first one to cross the finish line? Is it neuron one does sperm, neuron two does the motivational thing? Does one neuron do both and the other ones we just don't know what it does? And the answer is cooler than any of those. It's that the neurons communicate with each other and show their evidence that it's time that six minutes has passed and reach a consensus. And that consensus drives the eruption. We can see that we can see these neurons communicating experiments like this. If we put GCAMP in all four closing neurons, but stimulate just one of them, express the red light gated uh, crimson in just one neuron. Of course, if we stimulate that neuron, we can record calcium transients, and that's what you see uh, in the dark red traces. But we also see calcium transients in the ones that don't direct, that don't express crimson themselves. So we know that these neurons are capable of recurrent excitation within this four cell network. When do they do it? When do they talk to each other? When do they need electrical activity? I kind of hinted to you that they don't need it at the very beginning, and I'm going to show that to you in these experiments. So we're going to do that using this other optogenetic tool, GT-ACR1. It's a, it's a chloride channel, so we're going to hyperpolarize the neurons when green light's on. I'm going to show you a video of what these experiments look like. It's not super interesting. These flies are going to start mating at the same time. If we don't turn the light on, they're going to terminate at 23 minutes that you're used to. If we keep the light on, they're going to mate for several hours. So you're going to see at 23 or so minutes, two dots over there, and this dot's going to stay together. And you can see the compiled data here. If you don't turn the light on 23 minutes, you turn it on, it's long. But this is the interesting data over here, which is what happens when we play around with light, when we allow the neurons to communicate with each other. In this case, we only allowed the neurons to communicate using voltage dynamics around that six minute window. So we kept the light on before they started moving up through the first five minutes while the CAMP2 timer is ticking down. It ticks down perfectly fine. It goes up and down perfectly fine. It's just the output that you need voltage dynamics for. And here we've allowed two minutes of voltage. And you see that that's enough. I'm only showing you copulation duration here, but also to transfer sperm to, to fill that motivational switch, to switch on motivational states, but also to allow the mating to terminate on time. That's the output of the core zone neurons to allow that to happen. And it happens perfectly fine most of the time without electrical dynamics. That's an important point, And I'm going to try to make it again here in a, in a different way. We're going to we're going to chop it down in a more fine-tuned manner. So here we're going to keep the neuron silence for the first 10 minutes of mating. Can't get two timers have plenty of time to run down. They're all at the bottom. There's nothing holding back the output of, of these neurons anymore, at least time-based. And then we're going to allow various windows in which we allow electrical activity in these neurons. At the top, we're going to do 30 seconds, and at the bottom, 90 seconds. So you can see the timer says 9.57. So these flies have been mating for about 10 minutes. So three seconds from now, the light's going to go off. You should think about that as them being allowed to communicate with each other, allowed to have voltage dynamics, and try to reach a consensus about whether or not we're going to transfer sperm and all the other stuff that comes with the output of these neurons. So three, two, one, the lights go off. This is sped up. So at 30 seconds now, the window is closed for the top flies, and it's closed three times longer on the bottom. And then we're going to watch what happens. Are they going to break up at 23 minutes or not? And you're going to see that on the bottom, these are all two dots. On the top, they stay as, as one dot. So even 30 seconds of communication across these neurons was not enough. When you think about electrical dynamics, it's fast. You know, like one second should be enough, right? Unless something else is going on. And we suspect something else was going on. So here's what this looks like when it's compiled. Uh, so it's not just these eight flies. It's, it's all of them. So if we have a 30 second relaxation window, they only have 30 seconds to communicate. The fraction of the males that are mating long is 100%, just like it's 100% up here. For 90 seconds, 100% or 0% mate long, then you have 90 seconds, that's, that's enough. And then we can fill in the gaps in here and find that there's about 60 or 75 seconds of communication that's required to produce the output in the absence of the CAMP2 timer. So now if we think about this from a time perspective, we had that 23 minute timer. Now we have a six-minute timer nested within it. 
And now we have a 75 second timer nested within that six minute timer. If you want to think about things from a, from a time perspective, which may be right in this case or may not be, but it's certainly a long period of time. And so we suspected a biochemical accumulation and we had other evidence that it was a biochemical accumulation of something. So we did what we always do is uh, undertake like a really huge screen of another 25,000 matings, another thousand and a half genotypes. In this case, each fly, each male got the two windows I just showed you. Got a, a 30 second window to communicate and a 90 second window to communicate. Well, we know that 30 seconds is never enough, 90 seconds always enough. And so that's how you get the density over here in the quarter, that gray density is by looking at the males that were, that the proportion of matings were long. When you had the 30 second, that means you didn't give the output. That's why it's at one here and on the y-axis is 90 seconds and that's at zero because 90 seconds is always enough, right? So what we're interested in is genotypes that when we manipulate the chorazin neurons that give us different amounts of time that the neurons need to communicate. And we got changes in both directions, most prominently when we affected GFS and cyclic AMP signaling. So again, we did this like screen that we're really proud of like the cleverness and stuff like that. We found like maybe the most obvious answer is cyclic AMP and PKA signaling. But the bright side of that is there's a lot known and we were able to, config, to put together a whole pathway of, of how the information flows both within the, both within the individual neuron and throughout the circuit. And that's kind of depicted here. And it's pretty, it's worth it. So GFS gets signaling downstream of GPCR signaling, right? That triggers adenyl cyclase to make cyclic AMP, which is then degraded by phosphodiesterases. Cyclic AMP, one of its canonical things is to activate protein kinase A. Protein kinase A can phosphorylate and potentiate calcium influx through voltage-gated calcium channels. That causes synaptic release through the rest of the, of the circuitry. And we know that it's reverberant activity, recurrent activity. So that will dump more G protein signaling. So then you'll get more cyclic AMP eventually, which will cause more potentiation of calcium, which will go through again and make you more cyclic AMP. And if we just cut out all the middlemen, what happens is cyclic AMP makes more calcium and more calcium makes cyclic AMP. And that's an unrestrained feed forward loop that's going to lead to the eruption. Here's what the eruption looks like when you look under a two photon microscope. This is the soma of a single chorazone neuron. And in this chorazone neuron, there are two transgenes. One is GCAM 6S, and we're going to monitor calcium dynamics. And the other is a photoactivatable adenyl cyclase. So we're going to punch in our own cyclic AMP in bursts for 500 milliseconds every 100 seconds. Okay? If what I just told you is true, cyclic AMP should lead to a calcium increase, right? If we just think about that simple feed forward model, and there it goes. Cyclic, a, a, burst of, a burst of cyclic AMP that we provided with blue light leads to a calcium transient that's been, then been gonna decay over the course of about a minute and a half. And so you can keep doing this. In this case, this is the third pulse, leading to the third, um, third decline back down to baseline. And this is calcium. If I was using a cyclic AMP sensor, you would see something different. You would see a gradual accumulation of cyclic AMP over time. So you should see that in the background. The cyclic AMP that we're bursting in doesn't decay away, away as fast as the calcium. It's still accumulating. And once it reaches a threshold, it causes an eruption. And so that's a delta F over F of 14. That's bigger than anything I've ever seen in the literature, often by a magnitude of 10. And then the system resets. We actually thought the cells were dying at first. Until we saw this, the system resets, you have a couple more pulses of cyclic AMP, and then you get another eruption. So I'm really excited about the idea of eruptions. One thing that has bothered me since becoming a neuroscientist, and specifically a behavioral neuroscientist, is looking at brain-mind activity and wondering, as Larry Abbott put it, where are the switches? How does something actually happen? When is it like enough accumulation? We say, okay, I'm gonna do this thing. And I could never see that, but I think eruptions could be the way to do it. And it's also a reason that I think a lot of the calcium dynamics could be sub-threshold, right? If we didn't give this extra pulse, maybe nothing, maybe nothing would have happened, right? Maybe an eruption never would have happened. And maybe that's what a lot of the brain activity is doing. It's the possibility of leading to eruptions, but it doesn't actually do it. So I think that eruptions are like action potentials for neural networks. And here's it working at the network level. So we're doing that same experiment. We're pulsing in our own cyclic AMP. And you see the calcium transients. And then every once in a while, you get an eruption. You can't really predict when it's going to happen, at least not from the calcium. But when it does happen in one cell, you see it with 100% fidelity throughout the network. 
So it's a network phenomenon that takes continuous inputs and turns it into a discrete output. And it's that output that the downstream targets are listening to to change the motivational state and cause the transfer of sperm. In this case, it's being held back by the CAMK2 timer. And I'm just gonna show you one more time here. In this experiment, which is a version of the same experiment, we're popping in our own cyclic AMP with two modifications. One is in this chromosome there, we've activated CAMK2 with that T287D mutation. So CAMK2 activity is high and CAMK2 should be holding back the eruption. And we've modified the length of time that we're gonna be delivering the cyclic AMP stimulus. We made it 10 times longer. And what maybe you see here is because of the active CAMK2, you don't even get these glyphs of calcium. Not only do you not get an eruption, you don't get any calcium transients in the presence of active CAMK2. So some way in a way that we don't understand, it disconnects the ability of cyclic AMP to, to drive calcium influx into the cell. And that's how the timer works, right? That's the, that's, the, that's the way it holds back the ding, is that the neurons are trying to communicate with each other, but whenever there's CAMK2 there, it just prevents the cyclic AMP calcium feed forward loop from getting going. We can see that here. And then KN93 is a pharmacological inhibitor of CAMK2. If we just put that into the dish, look at the same neuron, we recover the eruptions. So it was CAMK2 that was holding it back here. So I'll say one more time in video form, and it was a lot, to, a lot of pieces to put together, but it's as simple as this. CAMK2 activity rises at the beginning of the meeting, declines because of the kinetics that are specific to this neuron over the course of six minutes. The timers are about the same, but different across the network. As the timers run down, you start to allow the ability of cyclic AMP to cause calcium to cause cyclic AMP that eventually winds up with an eruption. And that's what tells you that it's been six minutes. That's what tells you it's time to transfer sperm and all the downstream consequences. So last a uh, couple of minutes, I just want to do what I feel is maybe my main job as a Drosophila neuroscientist. And that's to, well, one of my two main jobs. One is to uncover fundamental principles that are going to be useful in other people's research. And two is to tell them why it's going to be useful and one way and show them how to do it. So one way we could do that is just in our own lab, just look and see if the principles that we found studying these four cores on the neurons would affect other behaviors. And so one is the ability of CAMK2 to track time itself, really measuring time itself through its decay kinetics. And the other is the eruption, which, which transforms continuous information collected from a network over time into a discrete all or nothing output. Hey, Mike, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure, Smell. Well. So when the when the fly is actually behaving, do we see eruptions before it makes the decision to terminate the mating? And the answer is is no. So in a normal fly, in a normal context, what happens is, as I showed you in, in the video, you didn't see the eruption happen, right? Six minutes came and went, and you couldn't see all you saw was the fly, the male fly on top of the female fly. So when the eruption happens, it doesn't say terminate the mating. It says it's okay to terminate the meeting if something bad happens. But if the eruption hasn't happened, it's not okay to terminate the meeting. You're all in on this meeting. So the eruption itself doesn't actually drive any behavior behind sperm transfer. It just opens a gate that allows the termination meeting, either because that 23 minute timer dinged and said, okay, it's time, or because things got too hot, or like somebody jabbed you with a forcep, or like threw a bunch of dirt on you, or like blew a bunch of wind at you, or like all the other terrible things that we do to flies in the lab, but they will respond to after the eruption, but not before. So this is gonna look like the same thing, but to me, it's a, it's a world of difference and it goes to chasing down that 23 minute timer. The 23 minute timer is really interesting because it's not like an egg timer or a, you know, a bean. The man knows where he's at at every minute for the last 17 minutes into me. We do that by supplying different kinds of threats. And you can see that here, I'm just gonna show you one. Instead of 44 degree threats that I've been showing you, there's a 41 degree threat. If we put it that before the eruption, so at four minutes here, of course, he's not gonna terminate the mating, but at 10 minutes, he'll terminate 50% of the time and 15 minutes, he'll terminate all the time. Like I said, we can scale this threat in terms of the time we give it to it. And we, we can find that he knows where he's at at every minute. And so we found neurons that we call copulation demotivating neurons, not super creatively. Uh, the controllers, they look kind of the same. Believe me, they're different. The whole function is different. If you activate these neurons, uh, what Ishmael 
Ishmael's question was about that'll happen. If you, if you stimulate these neurons, the male will terminate the mating if you stimulate it past the threshold. So these neurons are keeping track of like whether or not the stimulus that comes in is severe enough to make you terminate the mating. And so how does he know? How do these neurons know what time it is? So I'll just use the principle that we found from the core zone neurons. We'll take away CAMK2 and you'll see, when you just look at this um, at the 10 minute time point here, that the fly in purple that has CAMK2 knocked down and these other population of neurons thinks it's 15 minutes, even though it's only 10 minutes. Right, he's spawning with 100% as he normally should at 15 minutes. If you do the inverse experiment, activate CAMK2, you see that even 20 minutes and he's still acting like it's the very beginning of mating because CAMK2 works in these neurons to time out 23 minutes, right? Not six minutes. It's tuned for a different function in these neurons. Okay, going farther afield and maybe things that people around here are more interested in. If I gaze at the literature and try to see examples of, for example, the eruption of CAMK2 influencing other kind of things that are happening, for example, place cells in the hippocampus. This mouse is running on a treadmill and it's passing the same place over and over and over again, but nothing happens. Like in trial six, nothing happens to this cell. But then in cell eight, something happens, this plateau potential, and then 10, 11, 12, all the way to 23, it became a place cell, right? That, that became a receptive field for, for this cell. You look here, nothing happened beforehand. There was no voltage, anything. It just popped out of nowhere. Last year, or maybe earlier this year, Attila had this really cool paper where he could do this optogenetically by stimulating that place cell every time an animal went through a place and, and got the formation of new place cells. And what was really interesting to me about this paper is that it recruited a network that looks like our Corazonin network, where if you stimulate one, you get activity through throughout the entire network. And this was additionally interesting to me because my colleague at Harvard now, Alex Rodenberg, when he was a graduate student around here, showed that CAMK2 messes up this process, this place cell formation process. So maybe things are just starting to look like eruptions everywhere for me, but here's a case where I'm pretty sure it is true. And this is in the gonadotropin releasing hormone pulse generator and the mammalian hypothalamus. And this is a really important super eruption looking thing that determines the fertility state of females, the, the rate of these pulses. And so Alan Herbison, who studies this, so these neurons project to the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland releases, for example, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone to tell the ovary what to do because the rate of these pulses tells from the brain, tells the ovary what the fertility status of the female is in, in humans and in mice and all mammals. Alan Herbison works on this at the University of Cambridge. He's, I've convinced him to try CAMK2 and see the obvious prediction would be that CAMK2 would be determining the span between these pulses. And he's checking that on mice and we're got our, all of our fingers and everything crossed to see if, if that'll work out, but things are faster in flies. And it just turns out that corazonin is the, is the molecular homolog of uh, the gonadotropin releasing hormone. It just turns out that females have 12 corazonin neurons. It just turns out that those corazonin neurons project outside the brain to a pituitary like structure, actually, two of them called the corpora cardiaca and the, and the corpora alata. And so we thought, well, let's check CAMK2 and look and see what happens to the ovaries. So this is a wild type ovary. The stem cells are at the top, and you've got the whole development of lineage forming a, a, a full egg at the bottom that's about to be ovulated into the uterus. Of course, the ovaries are paired, so that translucent part is the, the tip where the stem cells are. If we activate CAMK2 with that T287B mutation and the female chromosome neurons, they turn into egg producing machines. This picture doesn't do it credit, do it justice because it's in three dimensions. Essentially, the entire abdomen of the female is filled with flies, and she's constantly laying flies. Laying flies, laying eggs. So they turn into an egg laying machine, essentially, with that one, one amino acid manipulation in CAMK2 and in these 12 neurons. If we do the inverse experiment and make it so you can't receive a phosphate group with that T287 residue, you can't become calcium independent, the females never lay any eggs. So I think this is pretty good, pretty promising that the Herbison work is, is going to, the CAMK2 could be timing out that pulse generator that's been studied and um, wondered about for decades. As we're doing this work, uh, there's one last thing that I, I want to show you that we just kind of stumbled into that I think is kind of telling. I'm just going to show one more data slide after this. This blue graph over here is I just took from an uh, infertility clinic. I think we know that in the third and fourth uh, decade of female life that fertility goes down in humans associated with menopause and all the bad health consequences that go along with that. 
we find that flies go through a similar transition at the end of life. So you can see here, grouped into 10 days of life, they ramp up just as human females do their ovulation uh, over, over time, maybe not ramp up in humans, but you know what I mean? It transitions into a, a state of peak ovulation over the first same month of life. Then over the second half of life that declines, and this we're just looking at the ovulation rate in terms of eggs laid per day. But if you actually mate these females, if you have them mate starting around day 50 or 60, they're always completely infertile, almost always completely infertile, unless you manipulate chorazonin signaling. So if we take away the ability of the female chorazonin neurons to make chorazonin or this pituitary-like structure, the corpora lata, to receive the chorazonin signal, we can recover, we can have these females be, fertility, be fertile throughout their entire lives. Right, a full, a full clutch of progeny from the mating that happens here at day 70 and in control females, they never sire a full clutch of progeny. And this is really exciting to me because it says that at least in Drosophila, the reproductive senescence at the end of life in females is not a passive, it's not a consequence of passive deterioration, but it's actively instructed by a molecular pathway that's homologous both at the structural anatomical level and at the molecular level of females, in females, female flies, and in female mammals. And remember, this is the homolog of gonadotropin releasing hormone, and there are antagonists for the gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor that people use in infertility clinics at high doses. So I think an obvious hypothesis is if we just reduce the signaling over time, we could delay, prevent the uh, menopause and maybe the consequences of. And I think that's something that we're going to be working on uh, to try to do in mice using those antagonists. But I think more importantly, it tells you how deep and serious things can get really quickly when you study molecular computations that are likely to be conserved in the really interesting places that that can take you. This is a picture of my beautiful fly room and um, giving credit to the people who did the work. The interval timing work was done by Stephen Thornquist, as was the work on the eruption that he did together with Maxi Pitch. The motivational, motivational dynamics, how the fly knows where it's at at every time during mating was done by uh, an RA in my lab, Aditya Galfam, as well as Lauren Miner, a PhD student, and the female stuff that I told you at the end about reproductive senescence was uh, the work of a postdoc, Shalata Alp. Thanks, everybody.